So that that's that's why if in a, in a way we we said in our article in February, uh, Greenwood and I in the Wall Street Journal that article in February fifteenth, we said inflation is knocking on death's door. That the inflation story is basically over. Headline CPI came in lower than last month to 5%. What is next for inflation? Our next guest has been calling for lower inflation, and he has been right yet again. He is Steve Hankey, professor of applied economics at Johns Hopkins University, and he is an expert on inflation, having fixed and helped many economies around the world recover from hyperinflation with establishing currency boards throughout his career. Steve Hankey has been calling for lower inflation after correctly calling for higher inflation last year. He nailed inflation forecasts to the dot, basically to 9%. Uh, It peaked at 9.1% last year. Steve? Pleasure to host you again. Welcome back. Thank you for having me, David. Good to be with you. Uh, Professor Hanke, let's uh, go over the latest numbers. Uh, Like I mentioned in your introduction, you were yet again correct. Our last interview from exactly a month ago, you were calling for lower inflation to go down to 2 to 5% by the end of the year, and we'll revisit that call. I'll I'll encourage everybody to check out that interview. I'll put the link down in the description below. But uh, generally, uh, just for those who haven't watched our last uh, interviews together, explain to us why inflation has been coming down the way it has and why this month's number is a whole percentage point lower than the previous month. Okay, let, let's go through the whole cycle. Uh, I, I work with John Greenwood, as you know, on this, and, and we use what's called the quantity theory of money to anticipate where the economy is going, where inflation's going, where prices are going, and that kind of thing. So the quantity theory of money uh, is, is really been around for an awfully long time, really since the 16th century. But the, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England and the European Central Bank, they, they poo-poo this idea all of a sudden. And, and what, what is the idea? The basic idea is it's the money supply, stupid. What is happening with the money supply will determine with a lag of about one to nine months what is going to happen to asset prices. That's equity prices, sensitive commodity prices, for example. Then with another lag, after you have a change in the big change in the money supply, with a lag of about six to 18 months, economic activity starts changing. Real GDP starts either going up or going down, depending on what's been happening to the money supply. And then with even a longer lag of about 12 to 24 months, you get changes in inflation. So so that's the, that's the theory and the transmission mechanism with all these lags. In July of 2021, Greenwood and I wrote a Wall Street Journal piece entitled Too Much Money Portends High Inflation. And in that piece, we used the quantity theory of money, and we said that inflation would go to 6%, maybe as high as 9%. It actually went to 9.1%. We also said it wasn't going to be temporary. It was going to be persistent. So we nailed the thing completely then. And now, if you look at February 15th, Wall Street Journal, Greenwood and I had a piece, high inflation will end soon. And that means by the end of this year, our forecast has inflation in the 2% per year to 5% per year. As you said, the headline number for March, just out today a few hours ago, is 5%. So so we're already in the target zone. Now, 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 why has it been coming down? And it's been coming down because the money supply has, has been shrinking for the last 11 months. It's actually uh, on, on a year over year basis, uh, shrunk by 2.35%. 2.35, this is unprecedented, David. Hasn't happened since the 1930s. If you look at the at the uh, bank credit, which is the biggest component actually of of the money supply, is credit produced by private banks. Uh, that has been declining too. Uh, it, it's been slowing down uh, since May 
of 2022. And it's been contracting by five, it's been increasing by only 5.445%, about five and a half percent year over year right now. It was running around 11% a, 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 a few months ago. So that's been coming down. Bank credit coming down, the money supply is coming down, quantitative tightening is still in place with the Fed. It doesn't look like the Fed is going to do much by changing. The federal funds rate, uh, there's about a 70% chance they'll actually increase it by 25 basis points the next meeting. So we have a situation where a monetary squeeze is on. A monetary squeeze is on and been on for some time. And that's why I anticipate that we'll continue to see these weak headline inflation numbers. So that's the, that's the long and the short of it. It's all about the money supply. For, forget everything else. I mean, I, I'm, I'm reading even in the Wall Street Journal uh, a, a couple of days ago, there was a, 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 a contributor, a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal is, is going on about food prices and so forth. Well, those are relative price changes, food either going up or going down. The the, the the, the index, inflation is an aggregate thing. It, it includes hundreds of items, not just one thing. I, I think I've spoiled uh, your, your outlook in the opening. I, I mentioned 2 to 5% was your target range. Um, but I think uh, more important than your uh, forecast itself, I think a lot of people watching would like to understand how you arrived, how you and uh, Mr. Greenwood arrived at that 2 to 5% target. Can you just, you know, in layman terms, walk us through the math? Well, the, the, the math is that something called the equation of exchange, and, the, and that's M, the money supply, times V, the velocity of money, equals P, the price level, times Y, the real, chain, the real GDP. So if, if, you, if you actually rearrange that little identity and, and solve for M, the money supply, so the money supply is on the left and everything else is on the right, P, P, Y, and, and then, it, then it's a minus V. You, you end up with the following. P is the target, okay? P is the target, that's 2%. The real GDP potential in the United States is about 2%. This is back of the envelope, David. I'm just giving it back of the envelope. And roughly, the velocity is falling by a little less than 2%, let's just call it two, just to keep it simple. So we have two M, the golden growth rate, the growth rate in the money supply that will allow you to hit an inflation target of 2% is two, that's the target, 2% inflation plus two, which is the real, G, real GDP, Plus, because you've got a minus and a minus, that's a plus for the velocity of about two. Two plus two plus two is what? Six. Six percent is the golden growth rate. That is a growth rate in the money supply that would allow you to hit the two percent inflation target. What did I tell you we were growing at? Year over year, the money supply isn't growing at a plus six percent. It's growing. It's contracting at a minus 2.35%. So it, it's, it's, it's contracting when it should be expanding at about 6%. So you know the, the inflation is gonna be co coming out, sucked out of the system and coming down pretty fast. So that, that's, that's why if, if in, a, in a way we, we said in our article in February, uh, Greenwood and I in the Wall Street Journal, that article in February 15th, it, it, we said inflation is knocking on death's door. That The inflation story is basically over. Inflation is knocking at death's door. Well, it, it happened. The, by the way, the consensus forecast for this month of March was 5.2%, which is down a lot from 6%, in February, but still the number even came in below the consensus of 5.2. It came in at five. 
So the thing is sucking down very, very much more rapidly than most people, with the exception of Greenwood and Hankey, think it would be coming down. And it's because of MV equals PY. In, in fl- as Milton Friedman liked to say, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. It's, it's the result of changes in the money supply. That normally would sound like good news, Professor, except you're also projecting a recession. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But before we talk about your recession outlook, I want to talk about um, over the last month, I've interviewed various um, experts and pundits, and I've heard the counter argument, which is that inflation is going to increase. And I'd, I'd like to just address some of these points and perhaps clear up any misunderstandings, if there are any. The, the first is that uh, this is this is an interesting argument, and businesses, a lot of businesses across America are likely to face higher interest rates this year as they refinance at a higher rate because most people locked in loans and uh, revolving debt at a lower rate from a few years ago, and that's expect- those fixed income instruments are about to expire and mature. And so higher interest rates are inherently inflationary, they argue, because businesses will have to raise prices in order to combat higher interest expenses. Does this have any merit? No, this is complete rubbish. Okay. This is... It's amazing how confused people are when they get into economics. They get their little feet tangled up in a hurry. The interest rate cost going up will do what? If anything, it will reduce the profit margins of the companies who are refinancing at this higher interest rate cost, increase their debt burden, increase their leverage, put put them in a corner a little bit, and and that doesn't spell a boom or inflation. It, it, it spells a slowdown. And, well, well, the, and, their argument, and their argument is that they have to raise prices. To yeah, combat. well, that's, that's, that's the old cost plus theory of inflation, which is nonsense. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. They're using, they're using what they call a, a cost push theory of inflation, which is rubbish. Um, the other the other argument I've heard is that the Federal Reserve has created money supply that's already in the system. It's going to take a while for the full effect of inflation. They argue to see uh, to see uh, it hit the economy, and so we haven't seen that full effect yet. The money is already in the system. We're yeah, about well, to. It, 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 their their theory doesn't seem to be working very well, does it? <laughs> they. They, all, all of the excess, there was a massive excess of money created starting in February of 2020. All of that excess, Greenwood and I estimate, will be completely out of the system, really like in a month or two. It's, 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 all, it's all gone. It, it, it's be, being exhausted, at, at the excess, at a very, very fast rate. And that's one reason, by the way, that Greenwood and I modified, you asked me to go through their arithmetic with the MV equals PY. Well, it gets a little bit more complicated than that. We can't really do it in a, in a podcast. But the nub of, of the story is one, once you use MV equals PY, which looks simple, but actually to use it, you got to be careful. You got to know what you're doing. And in knowing what we're doing, Greenwood and I have made adjustments and so forth due to this excess overhang and and have determined that the excess will be out of the system by June or July. All of the excess will be out. Uh, One other argument is that, uh, well, not so much of an argument, but a point of concern is that the Federal Reserve has uh, increased their balance sheet uh, since the beginning of March. Uh, I've showed you this chart before we spoke, Professor. You see this slight uptick. Uh, They worry that this is the beginning of some sort of quantitative easing program, which would provide more liquidity and boost inflation. Can you comment on what's been going on? Yeah, well, no, quantitative tightening and shrinking is, is still going on. And, and what you see, the little blip up, that, that's, that's liquidity loans, short-term liquidity loans at penalty interest rates to, to banks, a, a special program that was put in place after the Silicon Valley uh, Bank uh, went under. And that does not affect the money supply. So the people looking at those charts, they don't know how to read a balance sheet of a central bank. 
this is a this is a real problem. As as Sir John R. Hicks always said, and I agree with him, there's nothing more important than a balance sheet. But you've got to know how to read a balance sheet. And and those who are pointing to this this uptick in the size of the balance sheet of the Fed don't know how to read the balance sheet. They don't know why it's uptick, and they don't understand that the uptick has nothing to do with the changes in the money supply. So, so it's just a misreading of the data, basically. That, in short, the people who, who make that argument, if I could be blunt for a change, simply don't know what they're talking about. Uh, I, I think you've always look, been blunt, look at the which money is why we have- supply chart, David. Yeah. Look at look, look at the money supply chart. Is it going up or going down? It's going down. That, that is my next question: is why why is why do we not see a direct correlation between the Federal Reserve balance sheet and the M two money supply? Some people have those two conflated for one another. Well, you've got to be able to slice and dice the balance sheet and determine what items on the Fed's balance sheet are monetary liabilities that are directly associated with the money supply. That, that's, that, that's what the problem is. Right. This, okay. this, so, but- this is like, this, this is, reading a, a central bank's balance sheet is a little bit tricky, I must confess. But the, the, the bottom line is accounting. And, and, and the people that are giving you this, this nonsense have basically flunked accounting 101. Uh, so bottom line, Fed increases. By, in by balance. the way, David, there, there are yeah. a lot of people that talk about these things that, that that just don't know what they're talking about. I mean, they're all over the airwaves constantly. I, I mean, this I, is I, why I, we I, have I, you on, on to clarify. This is why we have you uh, to, on to clarify some misconceptions. So, I mean, that that is okay. So, uh, you, you, that is a very important point you brought up because a lot of people think that just because the Fed increases their balance sheet on occasion, that inflation must go up. And they cite prior cases, like they ask me questions like, "Hey, David, why why is it that inflation didn't go up in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the 2010s following the Great Financial Crisis because we saw several rounds of quantitative easing." Um, just briefly well, I can tell you, I can tell you why it didn't. Because at that time, about ninety percent of the money supply was created by commercial banks, not the Fed. And what was happening then? We had Dodd Frank legislation. We had Basel III capital requirement increases, and 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 the 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 money supply, loans and leases by commercial banks were actually going down. They were negative. They weren't contributing anything. They were sucking out of the system. And to replace that that sucking sound and stop that, quantitative easing one, two, and three occurred. And the money supply grew at a, at a very moderate rate during that period, almost, by the way, roughly at that golden growth rate. Remember I gave you that 6% number a minute ago? The, 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 the growth rate in the money supply was about five and a half, six percent, maybe six and a half percent throughout the Great Recession. We never had inflation, by the way. We never had much inflation. And we had a slow recovery during the Great Recession. And, and, and if we hadn't had quantitative easing and an explosion in the balance sheet of the Fed that offset the contraction of the commercial bank contributions to the money supply, we would have had a great depression, not a great recession. So, so people, people just you, you have to be able to read the line items in the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, which most people have no idea what that how to do that. Let's talk a little bit about the Federal Reserve and what you think may be next, Professor, because you've been pretty correct on that as well. Now. Uh, All eyes are on whether or not the Fed will pivot anytime soon within the next year. By pivot, I mean cut rates, not pause rate hikes. Now, Jerome Powell has made it clear that he needs to see the labor market soften before that happens, even if you are correct and uh, inflation comes back down to within the 2 to 5%. Well, we're already in the 5% range, but even lower towards the 2% uh, target, uh, the Federal Reserve still needs to see the labor market soften. On paper, Professor, the labor market has actually been improving 
and I'd like you to address why it is that the unemployment rate ticked down, not up in the last reading, to 3.5%, while the labor force participation rate continues to grind slightly higher. Well, th- this is a good point. Uh, th- this gets into all these lags, and people get confused about the lags. The labor market is a very lagging indicator. The labor market starts deteriorating once you actually get into a recession, not before you get into recession. P- people don't fire people b- because they think we're going to have a recession. They fire people once you get into the recession. So it's a very lagging indicator. And, and, and if you're looking at that, you're looking at the rear view mirror, basically. You're not looking out the, uh, out the front windshield of the car. As far as the pivot goes, if you, you, the, the only objective way to look at this is to look at the federal funds futures market at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And I just looked at it this morning, and the probability of them holding tight in this federal funds rate of four and, a, four and three quarters percent to, to five percent on the May 3rd meeting is uh, 20, 29.6%. That's the probability of that. The probability of increasing the federal funds rate by 25 basis points May 3rd is actually 70.4%. So the market participants, people with skin in the game, they think the Fed will increase the Fed funds rate in May, May on May 3rd by 25 basis points and put us in a a five to five and a quarter percent target range. And so going back to the recession now, you have predicted that there is a higher probability of a recession, which is what we talked about last time. Have you changed that probability? No, it's, 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 it's just baked in the cake. There, there, there's, look, remember I said that with a lag of about six to 18 months, David, after you get big changes in the money supply, you get changes in economic activity. So we, we've been 11 months since the money supply started going down, okay? And, and that, that puts us right in this six to 18 month zone. We're starting to get into it right now. So I think the, I think the recession and weakness in the economy are just around the corner. Uh, gold is an interesting asset class. It's been responding very well uh, to market forces over the last month or two. Uh, in your opinion, why has gold been going up? Gold's been going up because it's a pretty good indicator of recession right around the corner. Gold usually starts strengthening about six months in advance of a recession, and it, and it stays strong during a recession. So that's one factor. And then basically also, it, it is a safe haven. And the the, the more the U.S. ratchets up its war with Russia, and, and by the way, the, the U.S. is involved uh, up to its neck in this war, a very dangerous situation. So, so that uncertainty also obviously helps a safe haven like gold. I think the banking problems that arose after Silicon Valley, that also did. So, so it's a little bit of a, a shall we say, a perfect storm for a safe, good safe haven like gold. And, and by the way, you, you can, you can we, we've gone over this before, but the, the hanky Kaufness Gold Sentiment Index, which, which you can get at www.thegoldsentimentreport, all one word, dot com, uh, will we'll tell you what the sentiment is in the market. And, and that sentiment, by the way, now that, that's a very short-term thing. We measure that sentiment every hour. We, we look at every article that's come, come out on an hourly basis with a computer, do text mining, and determine is, a, is that article bullish or bearish? And then we come up with a sentiment score. And if the sentiment score happens to be very positive, bullish, we, 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 we would want to be doing a shall we say, a contrary trade. If, it's, if the sentiment is extremely bullish, we know it will revert back to neutrality or bearish pretty soon. 
And as a result, you want to take your long position off or institute a short position. So we've been trading this thing, by the way, and it's been trading very well. The drawdowns are very, have been very small, and the returns, depending on the algorithm that we have hooked up to the sentiment, uh, the returns have been in the 30 to 50% range. So that's the hanky Kaufness gold sentiment score, which tells you on the short term, where where is the sentiment in, in the gold market? So if you want to be short term on top of it, you go to the Hanky Kaufness Gold Sentiment Score. The long term fundamentals, as I we've already gone over, look look like they're going up. Okay, we'll put a link in the description down below. Now, just to be clear, your sentiment doesn't give forecast, does it? It's it's a no, is no. It, it's, would you call no, it? No, a, no, no, no. It's it's measuring. It's it's like a barometer. Right. Remember the bar, the and but so the, if you look at the barometer, the sentiment. It, it it will tell you what the weather is going to be, so you can you can make a forecast in the, in the following sense: if you get an extremely bullish reading on sentiment, we know that that won't stay there very long. It'll it'll start moving back towards neutrality, maybe even bearish. And therefore, what's that tell you? That tells you what's going to happen to the market price going forward. It's probably going to go down. Yes, the U.S. dollar has been weakening, which some people have said may also have contributed to gold's strength. I just want to comment on the U.S. dollar before we close off, Professor. This will be my um, last talking point with you. There's been this um, trend of de-dollarization making the headlines. People are concerned about various aspects of de-dollarization, which I'd like you to clarify for us. Perhaps there's some misunderstanding around this as well. When you see headlines like China and Russia trading amongst themselves, when you see headlines like Brazil adding the yuan to its reserves, I think the Chinese yuan is now their second largest reserves ahead of the euro. This news came in a few weeks ago. Uh, when you see headlines like uh, countries uh, buying oil in another currency besides the U.S. dollar, which is to say that the petrol dollar is being phased out, does this concern you that the U.S. dollar will no longer remain the hegemonic reserve currency of the world? And if so, does this have any impact whatsoever on the economy and investments? Well, that, that's a big set of questions, David. Uh, let, let me let me try to summarize what, what I think is going on. Remember my ninety-five percent rule. Ninety-five percent of what you read in the financial press is either wrong or irrelevant. So these headlines you're reading about are are in a way irrelevant right now, in the sense that all these changes you're talking about are really tiny, minor footnotes in the in the whole scheme of an international currency. They, they don't really, as I, as I say, they're a footnote, not, not a headline. They should be a footnote, not a headline. But the U.S. has proceeded to weaponize the dollar and with sanctions, especially on Russia, but other, other places. They're sanctioning everybody under the sun, the U.S. They're, the U.S. seems to be want to go to war with everybody, basically. And... They, they have been using the U.S. dollar financial system and U.S. dollar and weaponizing it to engage in hostile activity against people that they don't like. Now, that, that does make the U.S. dollar vulnerable in the long run, and it, and it makes it inviting for a challenger to try to challenge the U.S. dollar's uh, dominance. But remember, since the seventh century BC, so are you? Are you with me? You yes, look sir. like you're kind of glazed over a little, David. Uh, I, I feel like I'm back in class, but I, I am learning. We're all back in class with you, Professor. Uh, okay, so if we go back to the seventh century BC, there there have only been fourteen international currencies, dominant international currencies. Now the U.S. dollar is the international currency. It's a dominant one. As you see, if you go way back and you only have 14, it, it takes a lot to knock a, an international currency uh, off the throne. So even, even though weaponization of the U.S. dollar has made it more vulnerable, 
is bad for the U.S. dollar, bad for the U.S. financial system. It, it, it is only registered kind of a foot, footnote little changes around the edges, not, not much, not, not much of any interest whatsoever. But it clearly is making it vulnerable. It's inviting challengers. Whether the challengers will be successful or not, we have to wait and see. I think forecasting the demise and death of an international currency is a fool's game. I, I, I just I really don't think it can be done. What I've told you is, is accurate and can be done. It, it, it is more vulnerable than it was, but, but to, to say it's going to end in death or, or there's going to be a demise of the dollar, very, very hard to say, very tricky, because the average life of an international currency since the seventh century, it's about 300 years. I mean, some of them have lasted about 700 years. I, I'd like to examine this in more detail with you next time, do a more in-depth conversation about the rise and fall of reserve currencies or dominant currencies. I think that'll make a very it, interesting it, it, and educational you see, session. Here, here, let me put this thing in context. The most important yeah. price in the world is the dollar-euro exchange rate. And, and, and when the dollar at its strongest, uh, a couple months ago, the dollar was trading at, a, at around, you know, one, 105. And, and now it's trading at about 109. And, and people are all hot and bothered about that, saying, oh, big move, you know, uh, the, the dollar is going in, into the tank and so forth. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous statement. Number one, even, even at 109, the dollar is extremely strong. I think the fair value of the dollar, the dollar euro exchange rate, so it'd be in about 120 to 140 range. So it's at 109, it's still on the strong side. And, and, and we have all these people blabbering around about you know, how weak the dollar is getting and so forth. It, it's just silliness. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for that. But, you know, there, there, there is a lot of silliness out there. There is. I mean, it, it's up to uh, it's up to the media to educate people properly. But yes, well, right. that, you know, that's what that's precisely why there's something called the David Lynn report. Well, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. We're going to bring you on to uh, educate the public as best we can. Let's let's do a more in depth series on currencies. I think the uh, the audience will find that useful because you have looked at currencies more in depth than more most people as well. The history of currencies, the history of hyperinflation, and you've helped correct some hyperinflationary economies as well. This, I'm not going to get into this but today, but the, uh, as you know, there's this misconception that the U.S. economy is hyperinflating. The, I mean, I, I, just before we close, yes or no, is the U.S. economy hyperinflating? No, <laughs> it, ne it never has. <laughs> there, there. There, there, there have been 64 hyperinflations in world history, and the U.S. is not on the list. Uh, just on the topic of hyperinflation, Professor, I remember you and I did an episode on hyperinflation a while ago, and you had defined hyperinflation as being a 50% increase in prices month over month, correct? Yes. Right. So uh, there were some people in the comments I remember asking, well, why can't it be 49% or 48%? Uh, uh, okay. Okay. What they call, what they call that... Uh, if there's something if you're in a legal case there's something called custom and practice and and what is the custom and practice in the economic profession what what do they use for the for the threshold the hurdle rate the hurdle is 50 percent per month end of story 40, 49 49 uh, in a court of law 49 isn't going to cut it so that that's what you can tell your silly respondent that. So if so, if economy is hyper inflating at forty nine percent, it's not technically hyperinflation. I think is that, the remark. That's that's, that's true. The, they're, they're, the the official registry for hyperinflation is called the Hanky Cruz World Hyperinflation Table, and and that's to get on that table, it's got to be fifty percent per month. Now, why did why did Nick Cruz and I put 50% per month? Because that has become the custom and practice of the economic profession. 
So, so there are a lot of people out there that have different ideas, different things. But if you look at the economic profession, that is the, the, the standard. It's a little bit like the definition of a recession. Who, what's the custom and practice? It's the National Bureau of Economic Research. By custom and practice, they determine what is a recession. So, so a lot of a lot of other people blab about it, but 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 uh, the custom and practice, what counts, is the National Bureau of Economic Research. So, so let's not waste our time, to, uh, you know, getting out in the weeds and trying to invent a new definition for a recession. Let's just wait till the National Bureau pronounces that we are either in or not in a recession, and that's that's it. It makes life a lot easier. All right. Well, thank you, Professor. Thank you for uh, educating us yet again. And um, we'll stay tuned for the uh, next important uh, data releases. And uh, we'll have you back on to uh, examine what's going on. Thank you very much for your time today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.